Hello and welcome to ICAC's Cotton Connect series, where we interview global leaders in the cotton and textile value chain to hear from them how COVID-19 is affecting their sector. Today I'm joined by Alan McClay, the CEO of the Better Cotton Initiative, based in Geneva, but with offices and outreach all over the world. The Better Cotton Initiative, or BCI, is the largest cotton sustainability program in the world and, along with its partners, provides training on more sustainable farming practices to more than 2 million cotton farmers in over 20 countries. And licensed BCI farmers produce more than 5 million metric tons of better cotton, which accounts for around 20% of global cotton production. Welcome, Alan. And let me start by asking you, how is COVID-19 affecting cotton planting in the areas where BCI is operating? especially in the Northern Hemisphere, where it is planting season now and accounts for around 90% of cotton production. Hello, Kai, and thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak to you and to uh, answer the questions that you're addressing now. Um, yes, so uh, as you say, we are uh, active in uh, actually in about 21 countries around the world, but the Northern Hemisphere is where everything's starting at the moment. Uh, originally. There were some fears of, a, of severe effects, uh, particularly in the Indian subcontinent, but more recently in India and in Pakistan, the rules of, um, of, of uh, mobility have, have been uh, re uh, relaxed. So we're finding that our implementing partners, our IPs, have, are able to continue uh, their planned uh, capacity building programs because the movement restrictions um, are, are not as strict as they have been in, in, in they're now being relaxed for the rural areas they're not as strict as they are in the uh, urban areas but we have got contingency plans for all of uh, all of our capacity building programs um, and I'll probably come back to them later uh, we do understand that some of the farmers are facing issues with access to fertilizers and seeds for the planting that you're talking about um, there have been delays in India for instance we understand that um, just under 50 of 300 producer units that we have uh, gathered through our IPs um, are already delaying the planting, <clears throat> maybe 15% of them. Part of that is because the wheat harvest is not yet complete, but it's also because of the restrictions we're talking about and the disruptions in the, um, in the supply chain. There are um, a huge batch of the PUs of our producer units who are scheduled normally to be uh, doing uh, a second wave in the middle of June and there may still be delays there because of uh, the, the lockdown but it's too early to tell as I say the, the relax relaxation of the restricted uh, movement rules are uh, give us hope that uh, there won't be too much um, effect on the sowing dates uh, and as for the you know the later ones, which is the the, the biggest the the, the the smallest tranche, the sort of ten or fifteen percent of our PUs are not planning to do that until the end of June. By then, we'll have more visibility. That's as far as the Indian subcontinent is concerned. In China, as you know, as most people know, COVID nineteen is mostly under control. And in fact, in the cotton growing regions in China, they've already finished sowing. In Shandong province, uh, would be our, our implementing partner is mainly. Uh, been using, uh, the, has, has gone into mechanization to plow and sow. Farmers are wearing masks and uh, the, the situation is pretty well organized and cotton planting is, is returning to normal. Um, obviously because of the requirements of quarantine, some of our capacity building programs have been limited, but it, it's still looking pretty, um, pretty well as planned. Um, one small note on the Southern Hemisphere, as I said, we've got contingency plans in place for applying our programs um, remotely if necessary. And we just started uh, testing remote assessment and remote auditing for, um, uh, for our programs in Mozambique. And, and, and the early signs are that, that actually the remote, um, the remote way of operating is actually more effective than we expected it to be. Obviously, there's clearly limits but um, you can compensate for them and I can go back to that if you want more detail. Great, well thanks. Well of course delaying in planting will um, eventually re result in reduced yield so that may be another factor you're going to have to consider. 
But yeah. what uh, for BCI in particular? What are the main problems that you that you foresee over the next few months and for the long term if the crisis should last beyond the end of the year? Yeah, you, you, you're absolutely right to distinguish between the short and the longer term because for us it's very much top of mind. We have an immediate priority at BCI from the point of view of BCI, and that and that is that we need to secure the programs that have been committed to this year. Um, in our ordinary calendar, we commit in January with our partners and our funders to which are the main programs we're going to be going ahead with. And that involves, this year, that involves some 90 implementing partners and some 4,000 field facilitators in all the countries we operate in directly. And unfortunately, COVID intervened after that commitment was made and before those programs were launched. So we need to be sure that we can secure the funding that had been committed to the programs and that we can secure that our implementing partners have got everything in place to, uh, to make sure they are, um, they are launched as closely to the plan as possible. Obviously, there will be some impact from, the, uh, um, from COVID. Um, but longer term, we're very much concerned by sector prospects. We think that there's going to be a second, um, second after effect of COVID is what is the impact going to be on the whole sector? And I maybe better explain that a little bit. We don't doubt that there will be a recovery. Uh, the, the, the dramatic abrupt halt in demand is due to the immediate crisis precipitated by lockdown and that that presumably is going to be temporary. But there's a few questions that it's still too early to be able to answer. First, how quickly will the recovery arrive when it does arrive? Secondly, how strong is it going to be? Is business going to go back? Is it going to approach the level where it was? Or is it going to be staying under at a much smaller um, or a significantly smaller scale. And clearly on that question, you know, Asia might be different from the West. Yeah. Thirdly, is there a risk of a second or even a third wave of virus and lockdown? Because that will impact, again, the sector next year. And finally, um, will consumer behavior, how will consumer behavior have changed from the experience uh, of lockdown? Again, will that be different in Asia from the West? So. Out of all that, really, you know, we're, we're very, we're very, we, and we want to work on 2021 now, although uh, the visibility is still very murky, because one of the biggest concerns for BCI is whether there's going to be a resilient and ambitious sector coming out of this um, with, with the ability and the capacity to, be, to become again vibrant and and a significant player towards sustainability. Some of the damage that the sector is experiencing at the moment may be irreparable. So we need to learn from this crisis and we need to implement our learnings. Um, so all that to say is you're absolutely right to distinguish between the short and the long term because we think the long term is going to be, is going to be with us. The, the after effects of the COVID crisis, of the lockdown, of the immediate impact of the lockdown, the after effects are going to be with us for a while and we need to anticipate them as best we can. Yeah, and those are really good points, and uh, and certainly those issues are things that um, we at uh, the ICAC are looking at now, and will be reporting on to governments uh, shortly. Um, so, what uh, what sector strategies do you think need to be put in place to mitigate these problems and to ensure that cotton can recover when the crisis ends? Well, as you know, um, BCI is is a um it's a farm level program. We, we, we're talking about a standard on sustainable agricultural practices. But we do depend entirely on the whole sector, on the whole value chain of cotton, and the whole, we, we benefit from the engagement and the commitment of the whole value chain. So we're extremely sensitive to what's happening in that cotton sector. And I think the simplest way of looking at it is we have to look at it collectively. We have to look at it as a total system and not only um, from the point of view of our immediate trading partners but think about the whole end-to-end -end value chain and clearly one of the things that needs to be enforced and that we can all benefit from and we can all work to to implementing is to have fair and equitable trading rules right throughout the chain um, I, I, I hope I mean you know things have happened now the lockdown has happened demand has stopped the, the impact of demand stopping has happened we, we can't go back and look at 
um, scapegoats. But what we can do is we can try and learn from the crisis and benefit from it so that we, uh, so that we can come out as a more resilient sector. And I think we need to learn that. And I think probably I can summarize the best, uh, the best way we can do that in summary is to look at it as a total system and look at how the total system can benefit so that the whole sector can come out and uh, learn how we can implement, uh, we can devise and implement fair and equitable trading rules throughout. Great. And you, you, you mentioned that BCI is a farm level program and you, you're looking after 2 million farmers, small farm holders. Um, what, um, what responses are BCI putting in place to help those, um, those 2 million plus farmers? Yeah, thank you. Actually, it's three million, close to three million this year, we hope. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm going to go into another figure, which comes from ICAC, actually, which is more than 250 million people worldwide, mostly in developing countries, depend on cotton farming. Yeah. And 99% of them are smallholders. So already before the health crisis, they enjoyed little economic stability. Uh, there's virtually no safety nets to fall back on. So we're in a prime position because we're actually, thanks to our implementing partners, we're actually networked very closely to large numbers of communities of farmers in a significant number of countries. And what we want to do in the first place is to leverage that network uh, through our implementing partners. We've created a COVID working group with our regional directors and managers coming together to look at how they can provide that network and put that network at the disposal of emergency services and health relief services and uh, people who are involved in bringing protection uh, to, uh, to rural communities on COVID. Um, so we're working on that. This is outside of the scope of the ordinary BCI program, but the, the fact is that that resource is there and we would be foolish not to be able to uh, allow people to, to work on it. I'll share more about these in, these efforts in, the, in a blog series we're doing on the BCI website. Um, but again, I do want to really underscore the importance of us facing this crisis together because everybody in the supply chain depends on, on the farmer and the farmer being able to come through this in a resilient and solid and way with, a, with prospects for the future and a more sustainable future. Uh, so we have to face it together. Now, it's true that in many rural areas, COVID is actually not, um, hasn't, hasn't been tested, hasn't been found. Um, I can give you one example in Gujarat, one of our IPs is working with 310 villages and so far no sign of farmer illnesses. Now, every, of course, you know, we're not testing everybody, everybody's not tested it, but there have been no, uh, there's no evidence of, um, of COVID reaching some of those areas. But tangible examples of what we're doing to support the farmers uh, over and above that, for instance, in, in India where large gatherings are banned, um, we're now organizing our farmers with WhatsApp groups, providing information on, for, you know, very short 60 to 90 second videos on how to take care, how to stay safe as in the COVID, COVID um, context, but also on other BCI core messages, which are about seed selection, biodiversity, raising awareness about pesticide cocktails, protection, protective equipment, testing, soil testing, that sort of thing. So much of the work is, continues as it has been. But we're adding in the COVID dimension and we're really relying on quite basic, well, it, it's, it's sophisticated technology, but it's universally available yeah. now. Um, we, we, th thanks to the internet and thanks to, to um, mobile phones and smartphones. Yeah, excellent. So how, how do you think um, COVID-19 will affect these uh, sustainability programs? Will this delay action on issues such as climate change, soil health, improvements in sustainability and social problems, etc.? Or is this uh, an opportunity to solve other problems too? Actually, that's a really good question. You know, pre-COVID, sustainability was, while it had become uh, central to lots of companies' preoccupations and governmental preoccupations, it has also been... Uh, one of the first investments to be cut in times of crisis. Now, I suspect this crisis might be different because partly because COVID, there's a lot of people saying that COVID is, um, is happening because as a, as, a, as, a, as a human race, we haven't been paying attention to sustainability issues. Um, but also because 
uh, there's so much more engagement now than there has been. And the people I've been talking to, including in the private sector, have been saying that, you know, they have no plans to shrink their sustainability commitments. And on the contrary, many of them are planning to increase their focus on it, perhaps even increase the portion of investment that they can, or that might be on a smaller f footprint, but there are no signs yet of it, of it being sidelined or, or being um, or being put aside or postponed. So uh, I hope that's a reassuring message. Great, thank you. You um, you will undoubtedly be aware of many retailers and brands cancelling orders with garment manufacturers and how this has had a domino effect through the whole supply chain. With BCI's aim of improving the livelihoods and economic development of its farmers, especially in Asia and Africa, it could be seen as um, a paradox that many members of BCI are also those responsible for creating the problems in the supply chain, which will undoubtedly have an effect on farmers and those who need support most. How is BCI handling this very delicate issue with its members, and what advice would you have to retailers and brands? Um, yeah, that, thanks. Of course, we're, we're very sensitive to this and it is a, a, a hugely topical question. We, um, we're looking again, we're looking at the whole value chain, end to end from retailers and brands on the one hand, all the way through to the farmer. And our primary concern is that the farmer doesn't get forgotten in this crisis. Uh, but we firmly believe that the whole sector needs to stand together and work hand in hand uh, with a view over the total system to be able to come through this, um, to come through this crisis and meet the recovery and learn from the crisis in order to make the, the whole sector more vibrant and help us strengthen our, our commitments to sustainability after it. Um, of course, we know that demand has stopped because of lockdown and, and you know, this isn't a slump. Some businesses have seen business go from 100% to 0% in a matter of days. And, and, and it's, it, it's genuinely a critical situation for a lot of companies. But we've seen a lot of companies, including retailers and brands, who are um, really setting a standard in matching, in meeting this crisis and working with their supply chain and trying to find solutions that um, help everybody to share the burden. So, you know, it's very... It's very risky to try and lump everybody into one category. Of course, some companies are, are behaving badly throughout the supply chain, but there are many who are setting an example and many who are showing how we can work together uh, by maybe implementing easier trading terms or finding some kind of compromise. Again, I think it's up to the whole sector to work together and to have a view across the whole supply chain because at the end of the day, we need to be able to implement fair and equitable trading rules for us all to be able to come out of this. So this means sharing the burden across the supply chain. And um, as, a, as an organization that depends on the engagement and the commitment of this whole supply chain, um, I think that's a message that's very, um, uh, very easy for us to carry. Uh, you know, contract sanctity is one of the elements of sustainability. It is in the member charter of BCI. And I don't want to focus just on contract sanctity because it's not just about saying you need to commit, you need to commit to what you've done. It's about finding solutions. There is an opportunity in fair and equitable trading rules to meet and talk with your trading partners and find what the best way out of a really difficult situation is. And that's what we have to be working on together. Yes, and that's certainly a position that ICAC would uh, endorse as well. Uh, final question from me, Alan. Will we return to business as usual, or has the world changed from good? Do we actually want to return to business as normal? Uh, that's a really interesting question. I can tell you something. The lockdown is, um, you know, quite traumatizing for a lot of people. Um, I think, you know, I've got clear skies outside my window. They weren't clear four weeks ago. <laughs> There's some real benefits to lockdown. Um, but more importantly, I think that you're absolutely right to ask the question, and it's one which we are asking. I, I, I don't know if we can say that the world will have changed for good, but I hope we will learn from this experience um, because we need to, you know, this isn't going to be the first kind of crisis like this. The, the, the problem of airborne viruses has been 
uh, addressed already, I think, for 15 or 20 years. And as a, as a society, we need to be able to face this kind of crisis because I think it's one of the, the aspects of sustainability. The other point that I would really like to focus on, and we need to focus on the sect, as a sector over the next six, probably six months, uh, but six to 18 months is really be pay very careful attention to how consumer behavior is going to change. I, I do believe that consumer behavior will change uh, in the short term, in the next year or two. The question is, is it going to eventually revert to the mean or have we come to uh, a sort of watershed moment? And I can't answer that question today. So when you say, will we return to business as usual? I think it's a really important question to be watching very closely over the next six months. Great. Alan, thank you very much indeed. Let's hope that um, we see a recovery in the short term. Uh, one of the things I've noticed about uh, COVID-19 is it's starting to bring the whole supply chain together. And we're now actually talking to each other um, from one end of the supply chain to the other. And let's hope that that continues and we emerge out of this crisis as a much stronger supply chain. Thank you. In indeed. Uh, thank you very much. Every cloud has a silver lining and that is the one that I hope we can come out with and that we'll be working more towards sustainability as a, as a result as a whole supply chain. Thank you very much, Kai, for this opportunity.